All right, everyone, we are back for a round two of Gary Brecker reaction video. So Gary Brecker claims he's a, a human biologist. He has a bachelor's of honors in human biology, I believe, but spent years as an insurance broker or someone who works in insurance and now claims that he is an expert in health. Very interesting whenever he talks about breathing because he gets a lot of facts wrong and it's clear he does not know a lot about it. He has potentially just watched a few things on YouTube. It seems like a lot of his work is taken from the likes of Andrew Huberman, Wim Hof. And then he does have some stuff around his own, around genetic testing, but everything he speaks to is essentially around his business. Now, what I do want to state in this video is that I haven't watched it. I've gone to a position because he, he usually talks about breath work and I've gone to a position in the video where he's talking you about grounding and then in the little clip at the bottom it says how to oxygenate your body so I'm just interested to hear what he has to say and I'll be stopping and just going through what I believe to be true or to be uh, false based off my understanding of literature which is stemming back to 2008-2009 is when I started reading into respiratory physiology and have not stopped still to this day and a person who's solely focused on this field so here we go let's let's see how this goes can i just get some other map that has the same yes. chart you could get a pmf bat boy they cost about five grand so if you got five grand lying around it's one of the best investments you can make you put it in your bed you go to sleep on it you run it you run a low gauss current at night it will help get you into a deep sleep you'll wake up alkaline every morning it will now that is interesting. Wake up alkaline every morning. So blood pH is tightly regulated between 7.35 and 7.45. If we go outside of those ranges, we start to feel very sick very soon. And we also die if it doesn't alter and goes back in. So our breathing is the first kind of mechanism that will shift as soon as our blood goes alkalotic or acidotic to compensate for the acidosis. And it does that for, by removing carbon dioxide, essentially. Carbon dioxide is something that creates blood acidity. But however, it's that important for us, for our survival. If breathing is to fail, our kidneys will actually taper back up. And our kidneys will either hold on to more hydrogen to bring us into that range or hold on to more uh, bicarbonate. That is the very basics of how important pH measurements are and how tightly regulated it is in, in the human body. Push the electric smog right out of your body because PMF can turn up for electric smog, 5G, Wi-Fi. But you see you wake up alkaline every morning. So when you change the... I'm glad that you asked that question. So the pH of the blood is a supreme narrow range. It's about five tenths of a point, about half a point. And it's a complete fallacy that you can change the pH of the blood by drinking alkaline water. Alkaline water watch cannot actually change the pH. All right, so he's given us a fallacy here, which is like leading in to go, oh, okay, this person's actually being uh, nice and tireless. Like we could, it's a fallacy that we can change our pH of our blood. It changes your blood. If you want to change the pH of your blood, amongst other things, you apply a low gauss current. pH stands for potential hydrogen, it's a chord. And so by running a low gauss current to the body or touching the surface of the earth, you actually can remove the pH from the blood slightly. And that does. An alkaline state is a disease-free state. The more acidic we get, the sicker we become. And so. If we are to take the whole of Constantine Biteko's work, he's suggesting that actually the majority of society is actually more towards the alkalotic side. And the alkalotic side is actually causing more sickness and disease. And we need to become more acidic. So there's these arguments all the time that we need to be more acidic, we need to be more alkalotic. Look, our breathing tightly regulates it. We will stay within that range. And there's no evidence that I'm aware of that grounding will alter your pH. There's just no mechanism. And so if we want to boom the pH of the blood, Slightly, if we want to wake up alkaline, if we want to run a low gauss current through our body, we can either touch the surface of the earth or buy a PMF map. So, so they've done tests where someone lays on a PMF map for a certain amount of time. They then do a blood test and they find that their blood is more alkaline. Yes. Yes. That there 
I believe is an absolute lie. And that separation of blood cells, you can see instantly I've been getting off of the PMF med. Again, I've got videos of me doing this to a production manager in, in my house, breaking his finger, putting it on a, on a slide, putting it on a, a PMF and actually looking at it afterward. The second thing I would do is I would learn to do breath work. I used, here we go. So first of all, if he, he has mentioned breath work. I'm glad he's got to that point. So he's just mentioned about splitting of blood, splitting of blood and measuring pH are completely different things. He's a human biologist and he's just mixing these things up here. So just, you've got to think of this guy's credibility beyond what he's just actually saying. It, it really just frustrates me that obviously not everyone is a scientist. Not everyone understands all this terminology. Not everyone understands that he can get these subtle things wrong, but he can sound very believable. And if you look at the comments in here, it's often people like, oh, Gary Brecker speaks so well. And it's, it's frustrating because there's not that. Unless you've gone to university and you've studied to a level of, I would say a master's level or research level masters and to look into literature, to be able to break literature apart and to be able to pull out critiques of literature, it, it's quite hard to critically think through the scientific method. And that's podcast and I do podcasts. It's very often we read papers and it's very speculative data. It's very just hypothetical because that's all it is, is a hypothesis. And he's taken what would be hypotheses in his own mind and making them as speaking them with confidence. And then the confidence then comes to then sell, talk about products that he sells. I just don't think that is, in my opinion, a, a moral way to use scientific evidence. Yeah, it's, uh, it's marketed something called a hypermax, which is based on Dr. Van Arden and Dr. Otto Warburg's Nobel Prize winning work. And that is the, it's called multi-step oxygen therapy, where you actually take an oxygen concentrator. So he's used a couple of names there. He's uh, Otto Wolgren and, um, and these people who looked into oxygen and stuff like that. You fill up a bag full of 900 liters of 95% O2, and you actually just breathe that 95% O2 for 10 to 12 minutes while you're they're going to treadmill. But if you don't want to have an Ewa. So what he's talking about here is oxygenated in the blood. Now in healthy people who do not have lung disease, who do not have uh, heart disease, who do not have blood disorders, typically oxygen levels are above 90, 95% saturated in the blood. So the available oxygen within the blood that's attached to an iron molecule in a hemoglobin. 95% of that is saturated. Unless we are sick or if we're at altitude, typically we can't really hyperoxygenate the blood significantly enough. Now, what he is saying here, however, is that he's doing a graded step test. So that means incrementally increasing the intensity of work whilst, whilst breathing this high level oxygen. And from what I'm aware, breathing oxygen at rest for healthy individuals, there is absolutely no benefit. Like you, you might remember those oxygen bars that people used to set up. I think there is some in places like New York, Ibiza, when I was a little bit younger and you'd have these oxygen bars that were all set up, but it was just huge gimmicks that would help with hangovers and stuff. And they eventually just disappeared because they were such a, you know, just a, a gimmick sort of thing. And now it's exactly the same thing as what he's talking about here. However, what he has stated is putting people on exercise. Now there is literature that when we start to get into high intensity exercise, really hard exercise, if we do supplement with oxygen, that it can improve exercise intensity. It can improve exercise performance at that level. But when we start to get into these anaerobic spaces, other than that, I'm not too much too aware of literature in healthy people that oxygen can actually have a benefit or hyperoxygenation can have a benefit. What well, exercise with oxygen therapy machine? She learned to do breath work, engage the auxiliary muscles of respiration, get oxygen down into the lobes of your lungs and out of the apex of your lungs. One of the, one of the articles that I quoted that turned out not to be a study, and I still can't find the reference for it, was that after age 35, 80% of people will never sprint again. All right. So 
That's probably true. That is very probably true. The last time I sprinted at Paul Mahaptrick, <laughs> I'm 36 years old. Um, I'm active. I do sport. I go to gym. I like to go for walks. I play you know, a role in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but I don't really sprint. You know, I haven't needed to sprint for a very long time. Sprinting is a very specific thing. We're in a safe world majority of the time nowadays. So people are not sprinting from lions and tigers, you know, and escaping predators, unless you're involved in a sport that involves sprinting, which is a very small amount of the global population. And that's very true. But what it, I speculate he's going to suggest here is that if we don't sprint, then we don't get what he's mentioned is we have air in this apex. Gas does not move by just being positioned, no flow. If we think of flow of gas, if I was to blow, imagine that gas is going to come out of my mouth. There's a pressure and that gas isn't just going to all of a sudden get to the point and it's just going to stop. It's going to keep moving until it slowly dissipates. There are tests within uh, respiratory physiology, respiratory science called ventilation perfusion scans, where they can actually look at uh, dyes, radioactive dyes within gas. So we can measure where gas goes into the lungs. And when people are sat upright, I've observed these before and the scans are quite clear. People take breaths and air just moves through the trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, alveoli, unless there is obstructions for someone who has something like COPD or, or severe asthma, the air moves regardless, right? Cause it's a gas. Gas is not like a solid or a liquid where it's still, it needs force. They're continuously moving. So. The, even the concept, a lot of people talk about shallow breathing, and shallow breathing only moving air into the upper portion. It's not necessarily true at all. It's like we are maybe not going to get as much into the alveoli, but we are going to get oxygen down there. Otherwise, we were dead. We wouldn't be oxygenated. Yeah, I'm, I'm speculating here. He's going to start to talk about people who don't take deep, deeper breaths. And... Again, I haven't been able to find affection. Clinical study of yours did an article, but whether or not that's true, the vast majority of people stop engaging their auxiliary muscles of respiration, really exercising our diaphragm, using the intercostal muscles between our ribs, pushing air down into lobes of our body. And as our posture collapses and our CO2 rises, if you think about the expired air in your body from the tip of your nose, the tip of your mouth, all the way down your esophagus, out of your bladules, into the farthest reach. Esophagus is where we, where food goes to. So I think he means tr trachea, uh, basic respiratory anatomy here as a human biologist has got a, a very simple thing wrong there. Again, yeah, he's talking about pushing air down using the auxiliary muscles, the intercostal muscles, we will use the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm. Regardless, that's just the nature of breathing. You don't need to take that, which is a deep breath. Your diaphragm only needs to move. I think it's one to two, maybe three centimeters to generate enough pressure change to feel the, the like 500 milliliters of air, which is all that's required to be able to get the oxygen into the areas that we need when we're resting. And I think we only need to go up to 800 milliliters when we're typically exercising. The depth of our breath doesn't necessarily matter too much in here in terms of oxygenation. What it does cause if we have shallow breathing is it causes rapid breathing that causes excessive stress and anxiety. There is a link to that concept, but we'd be, everyone would be walking around like they have low oxygen levels. And if you wear an oxygen saturation monitor, unless you have heart disease, unless you have blood disorders, unless you have lung pathology, you're pretty well oxygenated. Reaches of your lungs, that's all expired air. Until you get the oxygen all the way down in how to expired air is air that's being expired. How can you have something within your lungs that's expired air? It could be deoxygenated blood that's come back with deoxygenated with high levels of CO2, potentially sat alveoli, but it's not going to be. If we measure someone who has a mask on their face and they measure what's called end tidal carbon dioxide, unless they have respiratory depression, which is not what he's talking about here, under breathing, typically people who are very large and overweight get this or people who have type two respiratory failure, again, things like COPD or respiratory muscle weakness, they're not going to have high levels of CO2 in their body. Their respiratory rate will increase to offload that CO2 to maintain that pH in an oil range. 
and the edges of the lung, you're not getting oxygen into the bloodstream. So as we age and our... So we're not getting oxygen into the bloodstream. People who have poor posture, aging, and not getting oxygen into the bloodstream, we'd be dead, Gary. We would be dead. Posture collapse or respiratory rate gets more and more shallow. We're essentially hyperventilating carbon dioxide. Okay. <laughs> Let's just break down what he's just said. He's just said that our respiratory rate, so remember the word rate here, is getting shallower. So how can a rate get shallower? You know, a depth can get shallower. A rate can either increase or decrease. Whether you mean slowing down, the rate's slowing down. But then he's saying hyperventilating carbon dioxide, which means excessively breathing carbon dioxide, which would go to the opposite of what he's just said. This is, sounds like he knows what he's talking about, but it's not making sense. It is just not making sense. There is, uh, unless he's anxious and he's worried, he can't get his words out. But this is Gary Brecker. This is what he does. And this is what he does across multiple levels of analysis of different things. Now, I'm only talking about this area because this is the area that I specialize in, but it, it's frustrating because people reach out to me and say, have you seen this? Have you heard this? And they spend money on stuff that they don't need to be spending money on which is accelerating aging. Aging is presence of oxygen is the absence of disease. And so by just learning how to do breath work, so one, I would ground, two, I would learn to do breath work. I do a Wim Hof style of breath work. I do three rounds of 30 breaths with an extended breath hold every single morning. It is the one thing. Okay. So he's just said the presence of oxygen is the absence of disease. And he's talking about hyperoxygenation. But then goes on to talk about how he does Wim Hof breathing with extended breath holds. So let's just break this down for a moment. So 30 deep breaths, he was saying he does three sets of it every morning with extended breath holds. First of all, when we hyperventilate, yeah, big deep breaths. Yes, we might get a small amount of oxygen increasing into our blood. But the majority of the carbon dioxide we breathe or we produce is going to be going out. So we go into a position of what we call hypocapnic, low CO2. Now, CO2 has a major role in being able to deliver oxygen to the working muscles. So carbon dioxide will change the shape of the hemoglobin down at the level of the muscle cell so that the hemoglobin can become more, what we'd call it, in a tense position, which releases the O2 to the working muscle so it can be utilized. So when we hyperventilate, we deep breathe, we actually reduce the ability for our body to use oxygen. Now, if we then do that and we do long breath holds after, when we do long breath holds, whilst we're not able to deliver oxygen, but because we're in a state where we are more aroused, we're more stressed because we've just hyperventilated, we're using more oxygen, less delivery plus increased consumption creates what we call hypoxia, low oxygen. So it's doing the exact opposite of what he is saying it's doing. He's saying it's, he did it for hyperoxygenation, that oxygen is, high levels of oxygen is the absence of disease, yet he's doing a practice which causes low oxygen and hypo hypoxia. And then I never, ever miss. Why? Ever. Because I make little promises to myself and I try to keep them. And I find that it would be nice if he made a promise to himself to stop fucking bullshitting. <laughs> Sorry, Gary. I lose confidence in myself when I consistently break really small promises to myself. All right. So I think I'm going to close that up there. That is clearly enough to just show you that within this small section here, there are at least six, seven, eight, nine, maybe even, I don't know, 10 critical mistakes that Gary Metbrecker makes. And uh, I don't want to be calling him out and to this, but uh, there is a moment where we need to understand that even people who say they're scientists, human biologists, and speech that they're doing good, the underlying intention behind this is to sell, to build business, to make money at all expense of not really managing what they're saying. Now, I know in this video, I've given my, a lot of my opinion and on what I see as, as his character. I don't know him personally. For all I know, he could be an absolutely lovely guy and just not be as smart as he thinks he is. He might have people 
praising him and telling him when in fact he has because he's got millions of followers. He's being validated for the way that he is. So this persona of this person who is a human biologist who's getting a lot of facts wrong is giving him attention, which is growing in business, which is growing his investor's business. So it's going to continue. Even me doing this video is providing energy to this vortex of disinformation. But I'm frustrated by it, as you can clearly see. And I'm also frustrated by the fact that this podcaster or podcast in general, I typically don't really listen to that many podcasts anymore. I used to be a big fan of them. But people send me these things and ask me to review them. And that's about as much as I do. So if you want to continue to listen to information that is evidence-based with, yes, opinions in there that's trying to create hypothesis where I will use words like a speculative guess. It's a hypothesis. It's a theory. It's a you know, solid kind of piece of science from information from a meta-analysis or a systematic view. I will often try to use that language of, we might be able to, there's evidence to suggest. Now that is typically when you hear that language, that's more of an expert in you than someone having solid evidence and saying they did this at home with a mate, or they, they've got video evidence of this, or they found an article on this. People who, experts understand that opinions always change. Science is always uncovering truths in different ways, and there's no one way that fits one person at one time in a particular position, particularly when it comes to having a product attached to that. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. And I'll, if anyone's got any more of these sort of things, I'll send, send more my way. If you, if you got, just want to know some information, drop me a comment, any questions and uh, give us a like and subscribe. Peace.